Welcome to the Effortless English Show with the world's number one English teacher, A.J. Hogue, where A.J.'s more than 40 million students worldwide finally learn English once and for all without the boring textbooks, classrooms, and grammar drills. Here's A.J. with a quick piece to help you learn to speak fluent English effortlessly. Hi, I'm A.J. Hogue, the author of Effortless English, Learn to Speak English Like a Native. Go to EffortlessEnglishClub.com and join my VIP program. I train you. I teach you. I help you. I coach you to speak English powerfully, fluently, confidently, effortlessly. So you think in English. So you are relaxed when you speak English. So people understand you, respect you when you speak English. You just need to commit. Commit, don't quit, to my VIP program. Go today to my website, EffortlessEnglishClub.com, EffortlessEnglishClub.com. Hello, everyone. Today we are doing our book today, continuing with our book, How to Stop Worrying and Start Living. Hey, Cardo, you're banned! Just joking. <laughs> hey, how you doing? It's going well. I'm doing well. Thank you, Cardo. Thank, good to see you. Um, good to see lots of good, uh, familiar names. Goez, hello. Fernanda, of course. Good morning from Brazil. Hello, Fernanda. They're in Brazil. Great. And uh, ah, Taha from Egypt. Hey, good to see you again. Very nice. Welcome, welcome, welcome. Welcome. Massimo. Hey, Massimo uh, on, uh, on Gab. Massimo's posting some really nice, beautiful, beautiful photos. Not nice. Beautiful. Beautiful photos from Egypt. Uh, from Italy. Oh, he's got the uh, Thai flag too. Ooh, Thai and Italy. Great. And Tata, of course, from France. It's raining in France. Ha ha. Donna and Tam Tamil Nadu, which I went to visit Tamil Nadu. I went to visit South India. Very curious about South India. I have been to North India, different parts, three different times. I have been to Nepal, but I have never been to the South. I'm very curious about the South. Uh, people tell me, Indians tell me, other people, travelers tell me, the South is uh, quite different than the North of India. You know, this is, you know, many countries, this is true, right? Different areas have different cultures. In America, this is true. The Southeast, the Southern part of America is different than the North. And um, I've heard that the South of India is uh, different than the north uh, so I know the food's kind of different uh, and other things too so very curious we have Manlika from Taiwan hey to you good to see you Johnny from Madagascar I think you're the first person to say hi from Madagascar that's kind of cool Jack Christian again lots of people saying hello 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 all right, shall we do it? Let's just start, guys. You know what to do. <coughs> no wasting of time. Let's get moving. We're on to the next section of our book. Now, just a reminder, we are doing a book club. We are um, studying, we're learning the book, How to Stop Worrying and Start Living. That's the title, the name of the book. How to Stop Worrying. Worry is like fear, worry, right? How to Stop Worrying and Start Living. And the writer, the author, is Dale Carnegie. It's by Dale Carnegie. It is a classic, kind of a classic self-help book. And now this is weird. Today we are doing part five, part five, chapter 19. Only one chapter in uh, this part, but it's a very powerful and this is a very deep one. So that's why only one chapter, I think. Uh, you know, the last section, section four had one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, had seven different uh, 
chapters or techniques in part four. This is part five in the book. Only one chapter, but it's a very deep. Uh, and what he says, he says this is the most powerful one, in his opinion, the most deep one. And you'll see why in a second, because it's true. So let's uh, let's just begin. Let's do part five, chapter 19. The perfect way to conquer worry. Part five. This is kind of the center of the book now. And he's giving us, in his opinion, the number one method to stop worrying. The number one way to stop being afraid, stop worrying, stop feeling so much stress, be happier. This is his number one way. The perfect way, he describes it. The perfect way. So what is the perfect way? What does Dale Carnegie say? Let's, uh, let's, let me change, sorry. Change my screen for those of you on video. Mm-hmm. Oops. Back, 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 back. There we go. Okay, here's what he says. Prayer, praying, praying to God is the number one way to overcome worry. Now, we're going to read some quotes from this section. Now, the first one is from, who's this from? William James, I believe. William James, very famous writer and philosopher. Um, uh, American or British, I can't remember. But anyway, not important. Here's what he says. Prayer, praying, prayer is the noun. Prayer and strong religious faith will banish the worries, the anxieties, the strains, and fears that cause more than half of our ills, more than half of our disease. All right, let's go back and uh, let's discuss the meaning of this Little word by word. Okay, so prayer, praying is the answer here. And strong religious faith. Strong religious faith. So he's not talking about a specific religion. Okay, he's not pushing one religion. So it might be Buddhism. It might be Sanatana Dharma. It might be Christianity. It might be Islam. It might be Sikhism, right? Whatever. Uh, Taoism. But he's just saying in general, strong religious faith and prayer. Banish. That's a nice vocabulary word. To banish, it means to get rid of completely. And actually, the, the original meaning is for criminals. So in, uh, in the past, now, this does not happen much now. But uh, in the past, in history, sometimes if there was a criminal in a village, a criminal in a town, a criminal in a city, a criminal in a country, they would banish him. They would, instead of killing him, instead of uh, jail, they would banish. What, what does that mean? It means they would kick him out. They would say, you must leave our country or you must leave our town and you can never come back. So they would get rid of him forever. This was a punishment and a very serious punishment in the past because you know now in the now that it, it would not be so serious that's why we don't do it you can easily go to another town and get a job and you're okay but in the past you know this was very serious you might die right because if you have to leave your town all your family all support now you're alone in a world that is very tough very dangerous so that was a very scary uh, um, punishment in the past but here we're not using it for legal. We're just saying in general, banish means to get rid of, right? To get rid of. So he's saying prayer and strong faith, banish, get rid of, worry, stress, and fear. And it's worry and stress and fear cause more than half, more than half, more than 50% of our physical diseases. We talked about this in the beginning of the book. Right where uh, worry and fear, mental stress, can cause physical disease. We all know this, right? We, it can cause you to get sick. If you worry and you're stressed all the time, you will get sick physically. Many times you will get sick. 
It will become a physical problem. Your worry and fear become a physical sickness. There's a scientific name for this, but you get the idea. So what's the solution? What's the best solution in the whole book, he says? Prayer and religious faith. Hmm, interesting. All right, next. Now, uh, next we get, he talks about Jesus. Now, Dale Carnegie was a Christian, so it's not surprising. He's talking about Jesus first. Okay, here's another quote now. This one is about Jesus. And this is Dale Carnegie, the writer, is saying this. Jesus denounced and attacked the dry and dead rituals that passed for religion in his day. He was a rebel. Interesting. Rebel. No He's really ne rebel number one, huh? <laughs> okay. Jesus denounced. To denounce is to strongly criticize. To totally criticize. Totally criticize. To reject. And what did Jesus reject? Dead ritual. Dead ritual. Not ritual. Not all ritual. But dead ritual that passed for religion in his day. It means in his time, religion lost God, is what he's really saying, okay? So people would go, and they would go to a temple, and they would make a sacrifice. They would leave some money at the temple. They would do something, you know, uh, sing a song or do something. But they were just, do. it was just a ritual. They're just doing this movement, but they're not thinking about God. They're not thinking about faith. It's dead ritual. You can also, you can do, there's live ritual, there's healthy ritual, right? That's where maybe you go to a church and you, you sing a song or you chant or you light an, a candle, but you're thinking of God, you're thinking of faith at the same time. It's a kind of meditation, it's a kind of prayer. That is a true ritual, a healthy ritual. But that, Jesus attacked the fake ritual, the dead ritual. And then next, Dale Carnegie says, he talked more, Jesus, he's talking about Jesus still, Jesus talked more about fear than about sin. And he said, the wrong kind of fear is a sin. Isn't that interesting? The wrong kind of fear is a sin. Not all fear. Some fear is useful. We know this, of course, right? Someone has a gun and they point at your face, they're, they're angry, it's a criminal, of course, you're going to be afraid. Okay, that's healthy fear. It's normal fear. We're saying the wrong kind of fear is a sin, right? It's, it's, it means it's, it's harmful. It will hurt you. What's the wrong kind? It's this kind of worry that we're talking about in this book, this kind of stress, this kind of anxiety. It destroys our happiness, destroys our health, destroys our faith, makes everybody unhappy, hurts our families. That's the kind of fear Jesus was criticizing. The wrong kind of fear is a sin against your health. A sin, meaning like an attack, bad, against the richer, fuller, happier, courageous life that Jesus advocated. Advocated meaning supported his teaching so he's saying jesus was teaching that to have a rich life a full life a happy life to be courageous and strong not to be afraid all the time if you're just afraid all the time worrying all the time stress all the time that's not good it's not healthy it's not helping you it's not helping your health it's not helping your family so jesus criticized that kind of fear that's what Dale Carnegie says. All right, let's continue. Okay, next we have a quote in the book from Carl Jung. So now we're moving to psychology. Okay, so we had, uh, first we had a, the, the original quote from a philosopher. Next was talking about Jesus, a religion. And now we're, talking about a psychologist, a very famous psychologist, Carl Jung. Very, very famous. One of the kind of early psychologists, right? Okay, here's Carl Jung. During the past 30 years, 
people from all countries of earth have talked to me. I have helped many patients. Right? So remember, he was a psychologist. So who came to Carl Jung? People with mental problems, right? People with stress, depression. They may be thinking about suicide, all of this stuff, right? They came to talk to Carl Jung. Please help me, Mr. Jung. And he says, there has not been one whose problem, finally, was not a, a problem of finding a religious outlook on life. It is safe to say that every one of them became sick because he lost living religion. He lost what living religions have given to their followers. And none of them, his patients, none of them have been healed unless they regained this religious outlook. Interesting. Okay, so I'll give you the summary, the short easy, understandable. What is he saying? He's saying that why are people sick? They are spiritually sick. He says, why are people depressed? Why are people want suicide? Why are people so unhappy? You know, why the, all these mental problems? His patience. He's saying because they lost religion, because they lost God, and that the really deeply, deep down, deeply, the only real cure, they must find it again. This is Carl Jung, a psychologist. It's an interesting, um, it's interesting coming from a psychologist, right? It's a little surprising. Next we have Gandhi, Mahatma Gandhi, a follower of Sanatana Dharma, Hinduism. Gandhi, says, said, without prayer, without praying, I would have been a lunatic long ago. Lunatic is a crazy person. So he's saying without prayer, without God, he would have become crazy a long time ago. So maybe you can understand this, right? Gandhi in South Africa and then in India was, you know, was constantly fighting uh, against the British Empire uh, the, the strongest, most powerful empire on earth at that time. He was in jail so many times. I mean, he had a difficult life. <laughs> uh, but he's saying that because, because of prayer, he stayed strong. All right. So interesting. Gandhi. Yeah, let's see if we have any more. Okay, next we have one from a writer, Dr. Carroll. Here's a quote. Prayer is the most powerful form of energy one can generate, one can create. It is a force, a power, as real as gravity. Interesting, huh? Prayer, praying, prayer is the most powerful form of energy. It is as real as gravity, right? Gravity is real. We can't see it, but we know it's real. We drop something, it falls. He's saying praying is kind of the same power. Okay, next quote, next section is, um, this is from Dale Carnegie, the writer of this book. He says, whenever, whenever we address God, in fervent prayer, two new vocabulary words here, we change both soul and body for the better. Interesting. All right, let's, what does this mean? Whenever we address God, address means to talk to. Now, this is a word, like many words, many words in English have several meanings, right? You know, ad address, when we say address, we change the stress. Listen to my pronunciation. Two pronunciations. Address, address. Number one, address. Number two, address. Same word, same spelling, but different stress. Address, 
address. Do you hear the difference? The first one, address, straight, strong on the first, the beginning, address, that's like your mailing, right? Where, where do you mail? Your, where do you live? Address. Now I'm stressing, more stress on the end of the word. Address. Address. This means to talk to, talk to directly. So when we address God, it means when we talk to God. When we talk to God in fervent prayer. Fervent means passionate. Passionate or, you know, emotionally powerful. So powerful prayer. When we talk to God in powerful prayer, we change our soul and our body for the better. He means we improve our soul, we improve our body. Just by praying, even if nothing else happens, just the action of doing it improves us. That's what Dale Carnegie says. Okay, next. He gives a story about a man who uh, named Glenn Arnold, just some normal guy who had a terrible, terrible, terrible hard time in his life. But then he, because he, he's, he decided to start praying, and when he started to pray, everything changed. And this is from that man. This is what the man said. The human race is not alone in the universe. The human race is not alone in the universe. Okay, interesting. And then he says, the same man, this, this man lost his business, lost everything, lost all his money. He said, as I look back, I am glad, I am happy now that I lost everything. I lost all my money. I became, I'm glad, I'm happy I became so depressed. I'm happy I almost killed myself. He wanted to kill himself. Why? Why happy about all this? Why happy that he lost all his money? Why is this man happy that he was depressed? Why is this man happy he almost killed himself? Suicide. Because that tragedy, that sadness, taught me to rely on God, to look to God. And now I have peace and confidence more than I ever dreamed possible. Isn't that interesting? So this man who almost killed himself was very depressed. Later, he realized, I'm happy because of this. Because why? Because, because of his sadness, because of his failure, because of his depression. He started to pray, and he found very, you know, much better happiness, much better peace, much better strength and confidence by praying to God. So now he realizes it's good, the bad things that happened, I'm happy because now I'm much better. Now, I had to sometimes, you know, and this is a general in life. Sometimes those terrible things help you to become a better person, just in general. I mean, that's true. I look at my own life. I can now look back and I see many of the difficult times. I also am happy about them because they also help me to learn. They also help me to become a better person. So... Of course, when it's happening, it's painful. Of course, right? When, it, when the tough time happens, when you feel depressed, of course it's painful. Of course. But one good thing about getting older is you start to realize that sometimes those bad things can become something very good. Okay, now, finally, finally, and I think I've noticed a few questions about this in the comments, so let's talk about this. He says... This next part is very important, very important for some people. This is Dale Carnegie again, the writer of the book. What is he saying? <clears throat> Excuse me. He says, even if, even if you are not, you are not a religious person, even if you're not a religious person, even if you are a skeptic, 
what's a skeptic? A skeptic is a doubter, right? You doubt, you think, oh, I don't know. I think, I don't know if there's really God. I don't know. I don't know if religion is really good. Eh, maybe not. A doubter. Now, in the Bible, they said a doubting Thomas, right? That story. <coughs> Excuse me. He says, even if, even if you are doubting, even if you are a skeptic, even if you are not religious, prayer can still help you much more than you believe because it is very practical. So he's saying prayer is practical even if you're not religious. What does that mean? What does practical mean? That's a nice word, practical 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 just means uh you know useful in normal life useful in normal life so not big philosophy right not abstract but just n useful in normal everyday life <coughs> excuse me my mouth is dry one second let me take a little water <coughs> <clears throat> okay, number one, why? Now, here's he says why. What are the benefits of praying? Number one, prayer helps us to put into words exactly what is troubling us. Yes, good point. So it just helps us to really think clearly about our problems. By praying, by sitting down and, you know, and praying in your mind or out loud to God, you are, you know, discussing your fears, discussing your worry, discussing your hope, your faith, your doubts, all of these things you can use in prayer. And you get more clear. It helps you to be more clear in your mind about your own problems, your own suffering. Yeah, so that's definitely practical, just very useful, practical every day. Number two, prayer gives us a feeling of sharing our burdens of not being alone. This is also true. So by praying, you, you feel like you're, you're all these problems, right? This weight, these problems that you're sharing, you're kind of giving them a little bit away, that you're not alone, that when you pray, you feel like you're not alone. Even you're far away from everyone. You're in the mountains. It's just you. But when you pray, you feel a connection to what? God, or maybe if not God, then at least to the universe, at least to all of nature, everything around you. And this makes you feel less lonely. Uh, in my experience, this is also true. Okay, now here's very interesting, and this can, Alexi, your, this connects to your comment that you just made. Prayer puts into force an active principle of doing. Prayer is the first step to action. It's the first step towards action. So it's not only pray, 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 and nothing else, but by praying, you will then go to the next step of action. It's the first step of action. And I also find this. And, you know, again, it's saying, you know, prayer is the most powerful form of energy you can create. And he says, call it God or Allah or Tao or spirit or the universe. Doesn't matter the name, but don't fight about the names. But it's a mysterious power of nature that helps us all. So what he's saying is that by praying, you create this energy, this kind of spiritual energy mental and emotional energy, then you can use that energy to take action. It will make your actions stronger. It will make your actions more clear. Your actions will have less fear. You let go of the fear in, when you pray. Now you are more ready to take action. Confident, strong action. Uh, I think that's also true. And then finally he says, why not right now? Close the door and open your heart. Even if you have lost your faith, even if you don't have faith, ask God to give you faith. Ask God to give you strength. 
even if you don't have it. And then finally, the end of the book is a prayer from St. Francis of Assisi. I'm not going to read all of it because the English is a little, it's kind of a strange uh, translation, uh, so it may be a little difficult. Um, but anyway, there's a nice prayer from St. Francis, a Catholic saint. And that is the end of our chapter. All right, so they're quite interesting. Very, very, very interesting. Um, maybe surprising, actually, in a book like this uh, that is very practical, that he would say that this is number one. I, I think that, uh, you know, I'm trying to think of what to say about this. I think that um, I really like his advice to people who are doubters, who are skeptics, who are not sure. Because I used to be that way, too. I used to be like that. I, you know, I would say we call this in English... Um, in English, we say agnostic. This is a nice word. Agnostic. What is an agnostic? Or this is talking about religious belief or belief in God. An agnostic means not sure. It's a very honest uh, position. Very, very honest. Very truthful. Which is why I think it's, it's actually very positive to say I'm agnostic. Because it means you're just saying I don't know. I'm not sure. But of course, none of us are can be totally... Uh, sure, right? Because we're only individual humans. And so it's totally fine. You say, I'm agnostic. I, well, I don't know. I don't know. I don't understand. That's fine. Just keep looking for the truth. So he's saying, even if you're an agnostic, go ahead, just pray. See what happens. Be scientific about it. Try it. See what happens. And uh, you probably will find that you will gain more confidence. You'll become more sure You'll gain, gain a stronger faith by doing it. Maybe you won't, but decide, you know, find out. But I do, I have found that his advice is very good in this chapter. It is a very, very strong and powerful, um, I don't know if one will call it a technique, but certainly a, a powerful force. All right, so let's go to comments and questions. Uh, I think this is a good one for comments and questions. Here's a nice comment, actually, from Ibrahim, because I think this is uh, uh, connected to how do you pray? Now, there's no, there are no rules, okay? <laughs> but it says Muslims don't pray to get something in this realm. I think that is overall a generally good um, advice. In other words, you don't pray for money. Oh, God, please give me more money. That, that, that's a selfish prayer. I, those kind of prayers, in my experience... And uh, in most teachings of different religions, and even psychologically, there's something about that that's just not very healthy. So what do you ask for? Number one, when you pray, you can just talk about your fears. Say, you know, God, help me with my fear. I'm afraid. I'm, I'm sad. I, I, I am depressed. I am hopeless. You can just share your trouble, your suffering. Just that. Um, or you can ask for strength, you can ask for faith, you can ask for wisdom, you can ask for understanding, you can ask for guidance. These are also good things. You can ask for, you know, goodness for other people and others, right? Because again, this gets beyond not just these little selfish pleasures, but then it, it opens your mind to so much, something so much greater, and this is much more powerful. So it's actually very good advice. Thank you, Ibrahim. All right, I'm just going to jump back. I'm just looking at the comments because some people were commenting while I was talking. All right, let's go back. Let's see. Okay, just catching up. One second, one second. Luisa says, uh, hey, Luisa, nice to see you. You make me feel normal with my weaknesses, as everyone. We all have weaknesses. We all have weaknesses. 
me and you and all of us. So, yeah. Yeah, we just work on them. We do our best. We do the best we can. It's our first code. We do the best we can. Not we're perfect. Nobody's perfect. None of us are. Okay. Ahmed says, your explanation is flawless. Well, that's very nice. Thank you. Thank you, Ahmed. That's very nice. Jack Smith says, effortless English is very helpful for us. Thank you. Very, very helpful. That's good. Okay, Lena says, Hi, from Syria. I think when we believe in God and live with moral principles, right? Moral principles, natural law, dharma. We are comfortable and interested in all things and people around us. Very good. Excellent. Okay. Rafiko, good to see you again. The power of prayer is so great. It has the power to defeat the devil and his power over us. The devil wants to destroy us, but God wants to bring us closer to him. Prayer is our tool to win that battle. Prayer gives us the strength and the faith to finish the race victorious. Thank you very much. Right. And now, Alexei, I kind of already mentioned. Uh, oh, yeah, you're basically saying exactly what I just said because... Uh, I think there's no sense to rely on religion only. You don't just sit and pray only. God helps those who help themselves. It's, a, it's an idiom, a very old idiom. God helps those who help themselves. It means God does not help lazy people who do nothing. <laughs> right? You also, God expects you to do something, to make an effort. You don't, so he says, faith gives us some power, some beliefs, energy inside us. The opportunity not to give up. Faith plus taking action. Yes, this is just what uh, we, I was saying right at the end of that book. Uh, at the end of our book, he was saying the same thing. Faith and taking action equals you are able to overcome any obstacle and problems. Keep your mind clear. Be with your God. And don't forget about taking action and everything will be fine. Right, right, right. Exactly right. This is not an excuse. This chapter is not an excuse to be lazy or weak or hope for luck. Okay? That's not at all what this chapter is saying at all. Alexei is right. It gives you, that faith gives you this power, this strength, this energy. It helps you to, uh, it helps your stress and your worry to become less. It gives you this great strength, but then you still must take action. You must still do, right? You can't just pray to God, please, God, give me money. You know, that's a terrible prayer. <laughs> it's a terrible prayer. You're just, I mean, that's, it's horrible. You can say, you know, I, you know, you know, give me wisdom, give me strength to do what is right, to make money in a good way, to use it in a good way, to be clear, you know, do pray and then what well then you have to start your business right no one's going to just give it to you so you still have to do it you still must do this this is part of life we've got to fight we got to struggle we got to fight for what's right cardo trying to joke again now i know you're a joker cardo i understand did dale carney commit suicide and no he did not <laughs> Emil says, this is why you need faith to overcome obstacles. Without faith in God, maybe you will give up. Many people do. This is what Carl Jung was saying. Carl Jung was saying when people lose this, and in our modern world, so many have lost this, they, they have then no hope because life loses meaning. They lose the feeling of meaning. They lose purpose in their life. They feel alone. They feel hopeless. It's very sad. America is full of people like that. It's terrible. Mm. 
Okay. He's moved forward. Okay, Dalal. Hey, Dalal. Nice to see you again. Hi, everyone. It's a powerful topic because prayer is the inner strength, the inner strength for ones who believe in Allah, God, and connect directly to the Creator in praying who will give you the needs and help you to overcome obstacles. Right. Exactly. Joshua says, you know, without belief, we are not able to achieve anything important. Right. You've got to have that, that faith. Even, you know, I've got, I had a quote from Thoreau, my favorite American writer. What does it say here? Okay, here's a nice quote from Henry David Thoreau, my favorite American writer. He said, if we cannot sing, talk about, right, sing of faith and triumph, victory, then we will sing our despair. What is he saying? He says, if you... If you don't focus on faith and triumph, right, the great, the good things in life and faith, if you don't focus on that, what instead you will definitely naturally focus on your problems, your despair, your sadness, your weakness. So he's saying we have a choice. And when you reject faith, when you push it away, then your mind is naturally going to then focus on bad things. Negative things. Um, <laughs> Vitaly with an unrelated question. Where will you go for summer vacation? Uh, nowhere. I have a baby in the hospital, so I'm staying in Japan. I'll be in Japan for the summer. Okay, now we have to enter Buddhism. Ong. In Buddhism, we have a lot of teaching about worry and stress, indeed. I believe the best way to reduce worry or anxiety is to live with mindfulness. This is meditation. I have been living like that since May 1st. It works. Yes, it does. Of course, like learning English, we have to take time and practice. Nothing happens instantly like magic. I'm really thankful for your teaching I'll turn 20 soon, young. Thanks to my teachers, I woke up to the truth in my young age. Yes, indeed. And really, prayer, I would, I would also add meditation. Now, Dale Carnegie was Christian, so in, in Christianity, uh, they focus more on prayer than meditation. But they're, they're, you know, I heard that someone described it very well. Prayer is talking to God. Meditation is listening to God, <laughs> right? <laughs> this is the idea. It's a nice idea. Uh, so meditation also. Absolutely. It's, it's, it's an amazing way to get rid of worry and stress. You know, you just, most people combine them. They do both. So, you know, they'll pray, for, pray, and then they will meditate. And then maybe pray at the end. So maybe you pray, then meditate, then pray. And then with meditation, this uh, mindfulness basically means having a, uh, the, the... It's kind of like practicing meditation during your normal life. Mindfulness it just means you're aware, right? You're, you're noticing. You're not just always thinking in your head all the time. You let your mind calm down and be peaceful. It, mean, it really means having a peaceful mind. Well, Din says, um, I don't understand about if you're not religious how to pray. You can still pray. Um, my family believes uh, to, to worship or to respect our ancestors. You can pray. Yes, you can pray to ancestors. You're just talking to them. You're not saying they're God. You're just, but you're kind of talking to the spirit of your ancestors, maybe thanking them. Gratitude. You can pray to the universe. You, don't, you can just pray. You don't even have to say a name. Just do it. Just see what happens. That's all.
Johnny, with a nice summary in one sentence. <laughs> Do your best and God does the rest. Keep your faith. That's really nice. That could be on a t-shirt. <laughs> That's very good summary. <laughs> do your best. So you have to do something, right? And God will do the rest. Rhymes even. I like it. Yeah, and Dalal mentions this, especially when your heart is pure and you have a strong, good intention. It will be powerful, right? If you're praying for someone to, hurt, for someone to, for for bad things, for evil, you're going to suffer evil. It will destroy your soul. So pray for good things, of course. And uh, home, I can't pronounce your name. Sorry. Hello, my life motto is "Do your best." Right. That's the first code of effortless English. We do the best we can. Just do your best, you know, make your best effort. Do your best. Can you control the results? Always. No. That's one of the messages of the Bhagavad Gita. You've got to let go of this desire for results. It seems strange. You know, this is kind of backwards. It does seem strange. I understand that in our modern world, this is a strange idea for many people that you would not focus on results. You know, in many ways, like the teaching of The Secret, for example, that book, is kind of the opposite. Just think about the result. Pray for the result. Imagine the result. I will be rich. I will be rich. I will be rich. I'll have a, a million dollars. Very specific. People who teach goal setting, how to make a good goal, they will tell you, focus on the result, focus on the result, focus on the result. Be very specific. I used to believe that. But I don't anymore. I don't Actually, I don't think that's the best way. I understand psychologically it has some power. It does psychologically. It does work a little bit. Um, but the better and older teaching of the Bhagavad Gita and, and other places I think is a better teaching, which is very different. What the Gita teaches is do not focus on the result at all. In fact, completely let go of the result. Do not grab for the result. Do not be sad and crying when the result is not good. Do not go crazy too much and happy and celebrate too much when the result is good. That seems strange. Why? Because what the Gita is saying, what Krishna is saying in the Gita, is that it is, it is your heart, your spirit that is important. As you take action, that is the key thing. Why is that most important? Number one, it's the only thing you control, really. It is the only thing you control. You cannot control the result. If you focus on something you can't control, you're going to feel powerless and unhappy many times. You cannot control success or failure. You cannot control what other people do. You cannot control luck. You cannot control the economy. You cannot control nature. Therefore, the final result is not in your power totally. Of course, you can try to help the result, but it is not completely in your power. What is in your power? Your own heart, your own soul. That is in your power. So that's why what Krishna is saying is that that is where you must focus. Focus on your heart. Make your heart, your soul pure and good. You know, this is why you're praying, your devotion, your connection to God. You're following Dharma. You're following natural law that you can control. And yes, you will get good results usually, but sometimes you won't. Sometimes you'll fail. Sometimes problems. But even then, when you focus on those things, you can handle the bad times. You can handle the failures better. See, the problem is, like, people, when they focus too much on results, what happens? Well, then often they will do terrible things just to get the results. We know very rich people do this. If you just focus on money, 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 I want to be a billionaire. I want to be a billionaire. And you pray to be a billionaire. And you focus 
to be a billionaire and you imagine being a billionaire all the time. You're focusing on the result only. Here's the problem. Well, if you're so focused on the result, maybe you'll do bad things. Maybe you will hurt people because you want that result so much. So you will do terrible things to get the result. Many people do. We know this. You might succeed. Maybe you, yes, you become a billionaire. But what happens? Now you are a bad person. And probably you're an unhappy person because your soul is now, there's something sick and bad in your soul, in your mind, in your emotions. So that's why um, the inside is more important. Your mind, prayer, all of these things are, or you should focus on. And okay, of course, do your best to get the good result, but it's not the most important thing. Okay, so Muhammad, with any, again, this idea of praying and what, you know, what is a good prayer and what's a bad prayer? So again, bad prayer, meaning a, a prayer that is, is, uh, will bring bad results and kind of will make your soul sick is praying to be a billionaire, right? Focusing on that result, praying for those specific results usually is not very good. Ah, oh, please God, give me a billion dollars, uh, right? So here's what Muhammad's saying. He says, um, we have a different definition of prayer. Uh, me and other Muslims have similar idea that we pray we actually getting closer and closer to Allah, right? So you're praying to get closer to God. You're praying to get closer to truth, to Tao. doesn't matter the name you use, okay? To natural law, whatever you want to call it. And to Bring, but give him our weakness and take strength back and to get forgiveness for our sins from him. He is the most merciful, most compassionate. AJ, you look handsome. Thank you. Right. So you're seeing the mindset to have. This is the powerful way and it does work. And you're seeing, you know, we're getting examples from all different religions and even uh, not religions. Uh, someone asked about George Carlin. There was a stand-up comedian joking about religion, use of religion in comedy. What do you think about him, George Carlin? George Carlin was excellent, uh, funny, and very uh, excellent uh, comedian, American, about politics. Um, his ideas on religion, I think, were um, good and bad. Uh, I think some of his joking and criticism of religious um, groups you know, that are that were not actually very religious, right? Not very true. You know, I understand his criticism. On the other hand, I think that he also, uh, you know, he had his problems in life. So he, he was not, he's not, I, I don't, I do not look to George Carlin for religious advice. Okay. He's a comedian. So do I, I don't agree with everything, but you know, I don't have to agree with everything. This is a nice prayer. Slavika says, I take a prayer um, since my childhood. I pray for health for myself and my family, for all good people. I pray for evil people to become good. That's a really nice one. Pray for evil people to become good. It's the spirit, right? It's the heart of generosity, kindness. This is all very good. Yeah, so Massimo says, when you pray in all religions, you must have faith, because if you don't, prayer doesn't work. You just need a little bit, though. Just a little bit, the little seed, and it will grow. That's, I think, what Dale Carnegie was saying in this book, is when he's saying, even if you don't have a belief, if you have a lot of doubt. You know, um, you know I believe in the Bible, there's the story of doubting Thomas, right? Thomas was doubting, doubting, doubting with Jesus, and Jesus was very patient with him. 
and basically saying, you know, it's okay if uh, just because doubts, don't worry, keep, keep looking for truth and eventually you will find it. So it's okay to doubt, just don't give up. Ah, Cliffy with an excellent uh, summary here of the psychological benefits of prayer. So now we're not talking about religion. We're just talking about just psychology. It's kind of like meditation. You know, meditation can be a very religious practice, spiritual practice, but it also can be very just psychologically beneficial. So psychological benefits of prayer are self-control. Yep. Make you nicer. Yes. Kinder, more forgiving. True. Increase your trust. And offset means go against the negative health, go against the effects of stress. Very good summary. Liza says, if I pray and ask for something, I always add everything would be best for everyone. Right, going beyond just yourself. Those are wonderful prayers when you pray for not just yourself, not just some result for yourself, but for others because this is this is like the first step of generosity the first step of kindness for others is in your mind <laughs> hoping for good things for them again it's the first step of action and eventually it can lead you to be a more kind person in your actions but it starts in your heart right often it happens much better than i could have imagined the endless intelligence is amazing right see the basic idea behind this is that the universe, everything, there is order, there is truth, there is intelligence in it and behind it. Even many of the great uh, astronomers uh, believe this, like Niels Bohr, one of the greatest, maybe the greatest physicist, certainly one of the greatest ever, believed exactly this, that there is an order and intelligence, which we, you can, you know, we can come with many names. Simplicity, Elena says, simplicity will save the world. Yeah, I think so. That's the, that should be the name of my next book. Simplicity will save the world. That's a good book title. I like it. <laughs> um, Salah, this is an English question. I'm listening to your lessons and podcasts since 2010. Wow, nice. I understand all your sentences. My question is... If I come to America, are there people that speak with your accent? Yes, many, many, many. I have a normal American accent, standard American accent. Yes. Uh, most people have my accent. Some, you know, of course, you might meet people with different accents, southern accents, New York, Boston. Black people a lot of times have their own kind of accent. Um, you know, they're immigrants, so there's, of course, there are other accents, but mine is the most common. Okay, Masi with a really nice comment, and this is coming from kind of the mindset, again, of natural law, dharma, logos. I believe if we act according to legitimate virtues or internal principles and have faith, automatically we will be helped dramatically and unbelievably yeah so this is the idea this is this is the very taoist idea you know the taoism the chinese philosophy the very taoist idea that there is a natural law a dharma a tao of the universe logos natural law dharma whatever you want to call it. It's the natural order, the natural way of the universe. When you fight against it, when you, you have free will, you have the freedom, you can try to break the law. You can. But when you do, you will get bad results eventually. It might feel good short term. You might have some good things, it seems, short term, but long term, when you go against the natural law, when you go against the Dharma, the Tao, Logos. Bad things are going to happen. And the opposite, this is exactly what Taoism teaches, 
The opposite is when you follow the natural law, when you follow and go with, in harmony with, following the natural law, the law of God, the law of Dharma, the law of nature, any name you want, but when you follow it, when you go with it, when you work with it, wonderful things happen to you in life. Your life in general becomes more peaceful, more successful in all areas, practical and spiritual both. Practical, like English, when you learn English in a natural way, following the natural law, the dharma of learning languages, it's easier, it's more enjoyable, it's faster, you get better results. But also morally, spiritually, when you follow that natural law, that dharma, long term in life, you get more peace, more happiness, more beauty, more truth, more wisdom in your life. When you break the natural law, when you go against it, yeah, maybe some pleasure, maybe some power, maybe some money, short term. But long term, you get more unhappiness. You get more conflict in your mind, more sadness, more greed, more unhappiness, more problems in your family, more problems in your relationship, more problems in your country. When you go against it, long term. So you can break the law if you want to. It's your choice, but there are bad things. This is the law of karma in, in, in Eastern philosophies. This is called karma. Yeah, now see, Alexi, this is part of, this is part of karma right here. The natural law, logos, natural law. This is exactly what we're talking about. I have noticed one thing. This is Alexi saying this. When you're making some good stuff for other people, when you're helping other people, your life is getting better and happier too. I don't know how it works, but it works, right? This is the kind of, yeah, this, this, this logos, this natural law, this, this, you know, the, 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 and of course, you know, natural law coming from God, ultimately, finally. It does seem to work, and it's not totally logical. Like, we can't totally understand it because we can't see it exactly, but it does seem to happen. You know, there may be some psychological part of this, but it does seem that when you really, honestly, in your heart, you're not trying to get something. You're just honestly trying to share truth and be truthful as best you can. Sometimes you're wrong, but as long as you're trying to be truthful, as long as you're trying to be helpful with others, and then you do seem to get more happiness in your life. It, that is just it. It is the natural law. It is the natural way. It is the Dharma. It does work. Just try it. You'll see. And the same thing happens, by the way, when you try to cheat people and hurt people. Oh, yeah. In the beginning, you feel powerful. You get some little results that seem good. But you know what happens long term? You're less happy. You become, a, you become an unhappy person. You become suspicious inside. Something just changes inside of you and is not good. This also seems to happen. And see, you can't, this is why you know, you've got to look more deeply sometimes. It's, it's sometimes you look and you see someone who's bad and on the surface, on the outside, oh, they seem great. But you don't know on the inside. And I just know from my experience in life that when you really start to know some of those people, you start to realize on the inside, eh, you know, in their regular life, they're not so happy. They're not happy people. They're negative. They're, they're angry. They're... So be careful. Don't look on the surface. Just because someone is pretty and has money, you don't know. You don't know. Anna says, I love your videos, AJ. Thank you, Anna. That's very nice. Thank you. Cardo. Hey, Cardo. If you're... If you were, oh, if you're not, we will not have a chance to listen and communicate with Native American Master. I appreciate your devotion for us. I hope you live 100 years. Well, thank you, Cardo. That's nice. Yeah, hopefully I can keep... I'll do my podcast until I'm 100. <laughs> 
<laughs> my grandmother is almost 100 years old. I have one grandmother. This year, she has a birthday, 100 years this summer, just a few months. She's 99 right now. My other grandmother is 94. So I have two grandparents who are 90-something. Well, that's, that's good. Belcourt says, AJ, how to erase doubt because I doubt myself that I can learn English. Well, you know, really this does connect to our topic today because sometimes with doubt, you just have to have some faith. This is what Thoreau said. Now, I'm, not, I'm using faith in a general way, not just religion, but I mean, just in general, you have to have a belief. You have to have, you have to have some faith in yourself too, just that it is possible. Sometimes it's not logical but you just have that belief anyway. So you just, uh, you know what? You just decide, I'm just going to believe and see what happens. And then you find out you can do it. You can do it. Many, 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 many other people have done it, and you will too. Andres says, you are the best English teacher I have ever known. Thank you from Colombia. Thank you very much. Thank you. I want to visit Colombia and drink coffee. <laughs> uh, Tuan says, uh, AJ, your eyes are so blue. I love them. <laughs> Thanks. Thank you. Ah, uh, yeah. Okay, here's a nice uh, saying in Arabic from Taha. Same idea. In Arabic, we say, do the good and throw it in the sea. Nice. By which we mean, forget that you did good and wait for nothing. Don't wait for some reward. Don't wait for gratitude. Don't wait for anything. Be grateful all the time, even if you're not paid back. The result is not yours. Yeah, that's, see, that's, I like it, right? So do what's right, and then just forget about it. It's, the reward comes from doing what's right. That's where you, you will get the happiness. That's where you will get the, the peace. That's where you will get the, all the goodness comes from doing that. Specific result afterwards, eh, sometimes it's nice, sometimes it's not. Doesn't matter. This is a very powerful mindset. It's a very strong mindset. Ah, Carol says, um, I guess you can call me an agnostic. I, I used to be. I never recognized myself in the Christian religion, which was traditionally the religion of my country. Yeah, me too. I'm searching for my path. I found the teaching of the Bhagavad Gita and the Tao Te Ching quite interesting and fitting my heart and spirit. Thank you for your recommendations. Wonderful. Me too. Ah, the Bhagavad Gita is really, 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 really fantastic. And the Tao Te Ching too. So, um, yeah, good, fantastic. That's great. The Bhagavad Gita is deep and powerful. <laughs> so, you know, read it carefully, read it again, read it again. It is nice with the Gita to maybe find some commentaries later. The, the Prabhupada um, translation of the Gita is very nice uh, because he has a lot of commentaries in there. Um, He's a little repetitive, I have to say, <laughs> in my opinion. <laughs> he repeats the same idea many times, but they're good ideas. Um, but anyway, Prabhupada has a nice, uh, it's called, the, what is it called? Bhagavad Gita as it is. Uh, is right there. <laughs> Bhagavad Gita as it is. Uh, Prabhupada's English translation is excellent. And uh, I think the thing about it that's the best is it has the original Sanskrit. So I like that. Any translation the original, because then you can check. Because every translation has um, strong points and weak points, right? I mean, this is why I know, for example, Muslims um, very strongly want you to read the Quran in Arabic. It's okay to read, you know, in translations, but you want to go back to the original as if you can. You don't need to learn Sanskrit, okay? But, but even if you just have it, and you can just check some words. This helps a lot to understand the original and true meaning. So you can, in the Gita as it is, you can look at the Sanskrit 
and you see his translation. He tells you word by word his English. But you can also, you could get a dictionary and check and see. Um, you could do the same, you know, with the Quran. You, you don't have to learn Arabic 100% completely, but you could just check some words sometimes and have your own translation too. Or you could do this with the Bible in Greek or Latin. Um, I'll give you another example of this is uh, the sutras, the, the Pali sutras. Pali is a language, an old language. It's the original language of the Buddha's sutras, teachings. And, uh, you know, in English, many people, many, many, many translators of English, uh, they translate the, the first, it's called the first noble truth, the Buddha's first noble truth. And in English, many times they translate they say, life is suffering. That's the translation. Life is suffering. That's what they say in English. It's a terrible translation. It is not the meaning of the original at all. So you're really, you're losing something in that bad translation. Life is suffering. That's not what the Buddha said. It's not what he taught. It is not the meaning in Pali. So if you, you know, like, and I, I don't, do I know Pali and Completely no, but I do know that the original word is dukkha. It does not just mean suffering. It actually has a much bigger meaning than that, more general. It means dissatisfaction. It has the idea of pain. It has the idea of being uncomfortable. So it's all of this. So it's The second thing is that in that translation, in English, life is suffering. That sentence gives the idea that life is only suffering, that life equals suffering. Because in English, sometimes, often, in English, is means equals. The Buddha did not say life equals suffering. Life is only suffering. No, that's not what he was teaching. It's a bad translation. But if you only read a translation, you know, like only, then how can you know? Maybe the translation's bad. And in that case, I think the translation's terrible. That it's, uh, I think a better translation is, you know, suffering in life, in life, suffering is inevitable. Pain is inevitable. Inevitable means we can't avoid it. It means that if you are alive, you will feel pain. If you are alive, you will feel pain and suffering. You will have problems. We all know this is true, right? Is it the only thing in life? Of course not. But it is uh, unavoidable. Unavoidable. Why was Buddha focusing on that negative thing? Because that's what causes us problems. When you're happy, you don't have a problem. You're totally fine. So Buddha is like a doctor, a spiritual doctor. And he's saying, well, first, what is the disease? The disease is our pain, our suffering. We're, we're not satisfied. That's why it's called the first noble truth. But you have to be careful with translations. So anyway, this is a long way to say that um, when you are reading these books. This is also true for great philosophy. Um, if it's from another language, strategy number one, get many different translations. Each one will be different, will feel different. So don't just get one. If, if this is a deep book, like the Gita, like the Quran, like the Bible, or like the Tao Te Ching, get a few different translations. They'll each feel different. Uh, even like the Iliad, for example, um, the Iliad, which is, you know, great. Um, you know, I've, I have two different translations of the Iliad. They are so different. It's amazing. You know, the Greek, of course, is the original Greek is the same, but the two translators, very, very, very different. I mean, it's, the story is the same, but the, f the, the feeling is totally different in those two translations. Very, very, very. One is very kind of direct but not very, not poetic. There's no poetry in it. It's very direct, easy to understand, which is nice. But there's, but the feeling is less. The other translation I have of the Iliad, much more feeling, more poetry, but harder to understand, more difficult to understand. The, it's a less clear translation. Which is better? I don't know. It's, it's actually nice to read both because I get the direct meaning. I First, I read the simple one, the direct one. It gives me the, the story. The, I understand everything. Then I read the more, poet, the more poetic one, and I get more of the feeling and the art. 
So it's kind of nice. And it's nice sometimes just for important words, you can find the original word, the original language, like, like dukkha in uh, Pali. Uh, in the Gita, there are many different you know, Sanskrit words. It's sometimes nice to find the original and find all the different meanings of that word and you get a better feeling for the original. You could do this with Arabic, right? You could do this with uh, Greek and Latin. So you don't have to learn those languages totally, but it's just nice. Get a few translations. Go deeper into these things. So that's why I recommend the Bhagavad Gita as it is, translated by Prabhupada. Kaihan Ahmad says, I think prayer is the twin of science because despite its spiritual actions, aftermaths appear in the body and mind. Yeah, true science. Unfortunately, we have a lot, a lot, a lot, a lot, a lot now of fake science, propaganda science. Why? Because of money. A lot of it's money and a lot of it's control, propaganda. So a lot of science we hear in the news is just fake. But true science, true, true science, when you go back, you look at, like, say, Aristotle, back to the beginnings of Western science, um, it starts back way back in Aristotle, a lot of people say. And it's, it is, it is, with him, it is connected to philosophy and religion. It's a way of knowing truth. Now it's something quite different. It's a way of making money for many people. And, uh, it's, and for many people, science is a way of uh, propaganda. So, but true, true science, when you look at the true scientists like Newton, you know, those old scientists, Newton and, and those like that, they, uh, it was not against religion at all. Newton was very um, a strong believer of God and a very religious person. And you'll find this is true. Again, you'll find this even with Niels Bohr. You find it even with Einstein. You find it even, you know, with, with a lot of those uh, more recent scientists. Because they would see it as, they saw this as, you know, working together, not against religion. So it's a kind of propaganda of modern mind control. We'll talk about this in Brave New World more. Uh, this idea that science and religion are against each other, I think is... Uh, is a propaganda technique. They want you to feel alone. They want you to feel powerless. Okay. I think we're almost done. I've got to go take care of a baby. Aung. Let's go with Aung. Oh, there's Aung again. Uh, as a human, we need basic needs and higher needs. Higher needs like God, religion, spirituality. We need them both. If we don't have basic needs, we're not able to learn anything related to higher need. Yeah, it's kind of that, um, uh, what's his name? Maslow's kind of idea. But of course you have to live, <laughs> right? You know, um, Again, like, you know, the Gita, uh, the idea is that you you don't see them as separate. They're not separate. They're the same. Uh, not only the Gita, um, even Thoreau, again, this, the American writer Thoreau talked about this a lot, how Gandhi talked about this too, how everything in life is spiritual. Everything, how you eat, how you, you know, build something, the work you do, all of these things you can put faith and spirit into them and do them in that way. In Buddhism, there's the idea of right livelihood, right? It means that in your work, you are still practicing mindfulness. You're still practicing dharma in everything you do, that we don't separate it out. This is a modern idea. This is a new idea, very new idea in human history that religion is some separate thing from everything else. That, and it's it's a wrong idea. So don't think of them as separate. They're the same. You, there's not a choice. Um, yeah, I'm going to finish with just one comment because uh, this is something I see a lot in comments. Not this one, but I'm just something that you'll see in... Uh, it's a technique of mind control and it's a technique of uh, weakness. 
So uh, this is an important technique. You will see it many, 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 many times. And uh, sometimes we don't we don't realize it. I think this technique, especially, it, I think we learn it in school a lot. That the schools train this this mental technique into us. What is it? It's the technique of false choice. False choice. Fake choice or false choice. What does this mean? It's the idea that there are only two choices and you must choose one. Many times with this technique, both choices are bad. I'll give you an example. An election in our so-called democracy, our fake democracies, right? So we're saying, well, you have two choice. You have choice. You must choose this bad person or this bad person, right? It's a, fa it's a false choice. Or we, um, sometimes you'll see this with when people use it as an excuse. So some people who are fat and unhealthy, they will make a false choice. They will say, well, I don't, I, you know, I don't want to just eat food that tastes bad and be unhappy all the time. What is that? It's a false choice, they're saying, right? In their mind of this fat person, they think there are only two choices, only two possible choices. Choice number one, I will be fat and unhealthy, but I will be happy and enjoy eating good food, delicious food, right? Enjoy, but be fat and unhealthy. Choice two, don't enjoy life and be thin and healthy. This is a stupid choice. Because it's not, you have many more choices. It's not only these two, right? There are many others. Thin people, healthy people know there are many other choices. You can eat healthy, delicious food and enjoy it and also still be thin and happy. Okay? It's a false choice. It's a fake choice. You'll see this so many times, right? Uh, should I be practical and, um, and be happy and successful in normal life or pray and have faith and religion in God. It's a false choice. You can do both. You don't have to choose this or this. You can do both. Right? It's not this or this. It can be this and this. Or maybe it's something else like with the food thing. Maybe you mostly eat healthy and sometimes you eat a dessert. Sometimes you enjoy a cake. But you have self-control. You have discipline. So you enjoy and you're still healthy. You see, this, these false choices we, that sometimes others give us this false choice, this or this. And then we're, it's like a prison. We don't see everything else. We don't see all of the other possibilities, all of the other choices. It stops creativity. It stops problem solving. Suddenly, we only see two possible things. And we want both or we hate both. Or we think only one is possible. But usually that's wrong. We see this kind of false choice all the time. And again, this comes from school a lot, right? So many tests in school, right? You, it's like the multiple choice. It's A, B, C, or D. Choose one. Only one right answer. You must choose. You have limited choice. But in real life, we have usually, mostly in real life, we have many, many, many possible choices. We, in many times in life, we can do both. It's like the simplicity we were talking about. The false choice. I can live simply and be unhappy. Or I can enjoy life and spend lots of money. And people think, which one? Uh, spend money and enjoy. Live simply. No, no enjoy. Not enjoy. Well, that's a, that's a false choice. You can live simply and enjoy all these other wonderful things. You can do both, right? You can also spend lots of money and be very unhappy. So there are, are more than two choices. So any time in life, any time in life when you think there are only two choices or when someone gives you only two choices, always ask, are there more choices are there more start looking for the other choices okay maybe sometimes life is only one or two 
sometimes, but usually it's much, much more. Usually there are many more choices, many more solutions, many more possibilities. This and this. Practical life and God. Both. Healthy and enjoy. Live simply and enjoy life. Both. Both. You don't have to choose. It's not this or this. It's this and this. All right. It's time for me to go. I must go take care of a little baby. You have a wonderful evening. Lots of love to you. As always, wonderful questions, wonderful comments. Very intelligent. Um, you know, I'm sorry. There's so many. I can't read all of them. But uh, thank you to all of you because we have a very intelligent, a very uh, uh, thoughtful Effortless English family. And, you know, I think for these shows, the best part are the questions and comments because you make the topic more deep and more interesting. So thank you so much. All right, lots of love to you. As always, you know what to do. Join my VIP program, Commit, Don't Quit. Become a VIP member at EffortlessEnglishClub.com. That's my website. Go there. Visit Commit, Don't Quit at EffortlessEnglishClub.com dot com. Mwah.